So welcome to another episode of Epigram. Today I'm here with architect Jorge Rigao. How are you, architect? Hi, how are you? Very good. So first of all, like the introduction of this gentleman it has to be quite long because the amount of awards and, and uh, experiences you have through your life has been quite amazing. And I'm just gonna read a quick paragraph and then you can add with that and we can go with the flow. That's feel okay. open to interrupt me if, if I said something that is wrong. <laughs> So yeah, Jorge Rigao studied architecture in Cornell University at Itaca, New York, and a Master of History at the University of Puerto Rico. His career covers over 30 years of his professional practice and education. Rigao has been awarded locally and internationally for 12 projects and four books, including two national awards of architecture. He was awarded the Henry Klum Award, the most prestigious of the profession in Puerto Rico. In 2000, he was bested as fellow uh, from the American Institute of Architects. Uh, in 1994, he was award awarded the Top Management Award, and in 2011, he was added on the Hall of Fame at the same award. Uh, Jorge Rigao was born here in Puerto Rico, in Arecibo. Uh, he has been an historian, pedagogue, and he was the founder and dean of the New School of Architecture Polytechnic of Puerto Rico. So welcome. Yeah, well, <laughs> thanks a lot for being here with Epigram. Yeah, yeah thank you. So well, I, just to start, I want to go in the back. Uh, first of all, my, my family is from Arecibo. Oh, well, that's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, how, how from, uh, from Arecibo, how do you got connected with the interest of architecture? It's not like now that there's so many elements and, and information that can be easier to understand that type of career, but I imagine back then, not necessarily architecture was like, the most talk about uh, profession, right? But in a way, it was because by the time I was going to graduate from high school, the School of Architecture at the University of Puerto Rico had just started. Hmm. And that was a big moment, it was the mid 60s in Puerto hmm. Rico. Those were the years where planning got its school, where a lot of urban planning was talked about. Mm -hmm. uh, so it was all in the air. Right? Okay. I don't think I, I, I got engaged with architecture in Arecibo uh, because I lived most of my life in Rio Piedra, San Juan. Okay. But when I look back, as I was telling some students not too long ago, there are some things about uh, some qualities or components about the house of my grandparents and my, my uncle and aunt, uh, some initial appreciation of color that has to do with your early childhood. And okay. I do know that some of the sense of scale that, that we award some projects <clears throat> is really a product of spending summers at my uh, grandparents' house in Arecibo. Awesome. Well, there were, there were also summers in, uh, in the southwestern part of the island. I also had relatives in Cabo Rojo, Boquerón. Uh, and I think my, my deep appreciation of the Puerto Rican landscape comes from those summers when Boquerón was uh, uh, not known very well by a lot of people. It was not a resort as such then. And all of the southwest granted initial opportunities of looking at Portacelli or the architecture of Mayagüez, and, and those made a deep impact on me. Okay, and then getting inside the school, because I can tell from your early career, you have been very engaged, not only like the typical type of student that just take the class and go home, it seems that you fall in love with the career and you, I don't know when, when that connection happened, you know, it was early studying the career or it was something after you finish? Uh, well, it, it's always difficult to try to acknowledge how did it start because there's a little bit always of serendipity. Okay. Like I said, I liked architecture. When, when I started studying architecture, I realized it was something else different from what I had in mind, and I was lucky that I liked it. Okay. Uh, and that, that made, uh, made uh, a, a significant impact on my decision. I also attended a University of Puerto Rico high school, and I, to this day, say I've had the greatest teachers all throughout my life, from elementary school through high school, people that were very dedicated, that were very proud of being Puerto Ricans, and all of that has seeped into my work and my idea of what life should be. 
great. So I know that you have worn different hats throughout your career, yeah. in, in parts of very involved in the in your you know in your regular practice, also involved in education, also involved in investigation, and many other hats that you have been involved. But I know that a lot of things went parallel on your career. I can tell books that were part of your early career and books that just came the other day. And and I feel like a lot of other things were parallel to those moments. I don't know if uh, yeah. let's 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 go back. You know, uh -huh. like um, once you finished school, did you start working with a firm or you started right away with your own uh, no, we would have to start a little bit earlier. Okay. Because since I was in high school, I liked to write a lot. Oh, okay. So okay. I liked architecture and I liked to write. Okay. And, uh, and those two things have been uh, in tandem throughout my career because the writing in regards to architecture is very much tied to research. And uh, because I went to school in Ithaca, uh, I felt that I had missed something that I thought my colleagues had by studying in Puerto Rico, and that was familiarity with the Puerto Rican uh, language or vocabulary. And uh, to my surprise, I came back, and I realized that although trained in Puerto Rico, most of the students were very much lacking because the professors were lacking interest in Puerto Rican architecture. Okay. The foundation of the University of Puerto Rico was very much uh, based on an idea of challenging engineers as the commanding profession in the island. So it was very much inspired by the modern movement and, and progress and all of the, the ideology that comes along with the, the knowledge that or the or the assumption that progress leads us somewhere else all the time. So then I had to do it on my own, and I started traveling around the island. And that's when some of the childhood memories from where I vacationed gave me an idea of what should be the initial points to go and see. And that was San Germán, one of the earliest uh, objects of my attention. Okay. So I came here. I worked at the Puerto Rico Institute of Culture okay. for some time. And then later, I was engaged to head the cultural activities department at the University of Puerto Rico. Mm. So for four years and a little bit more, I was engaged in choosing all of the cultural attractions, opera, ballet, theater, uh, music, for the University of Puerto Rico. And that was a big school. That's where I, I always say that was my most challenging job that early, because everything had to be ready for one day at one hour at one time for the curtain to go up. Okay. And that was a big school. That's great. And when, when did you start channeling yourself to, to, you know, have something of, of your own? You know, I know that early in your career you started, you know, having your own firm, like with different, yeah, yeah okay. Yeah, uh, I, I don't think it's a conscious move. You have a drive and you have some interests and how do all those interests come together is something that I don't think anyone is in full control in their lives. Uh, you can control some, you can push for things because you make choices. But uh, from my point of view, after, after I left UPR, then I became the first executive director of the Architects Association in Puerto Rico, which had just been founded. So okay. I was still not being engaged in the profession as such. Uh, it was when Hector Arce, who was my first partner, invited me to join him, and then we, we started our own firm. And from the beginning, both Hector and myself were very much interested in Puerto Rico, Puerto Rican history, and, uh, and how architecture can communicate more than just the formal aspects of its uh, identity. Uh, and then, like many partnerships, you know, Hector had some interests, I had others, and then I went on my own. Okay. And that's when I started ha having in my office many of the alumni, people that I had taught, that now were eager to join in, in the profession. That's great. So something that I, I just go back to Arce and Rigao, uh, in that time of your career, I'm just, because it's early part, I think you, you were learning a lot in that process as well. Uh, I, the type of architect he was compared to you, very different? 
you know, like the type of interests, like the, you know, like it's the typical uh, sketcher architect, you know, the tra traditional way. I don't, I don't know well how the process of his work was, Hector uh -huh. Arce, compared to yours that I know you because you were my professor. Uh, and how do you guys complement each other somehow? I'm just like, oh, yeah, we, we did, first of all, because we shared a Cornell background. Okay. Uh, and that was a big thing. And, and it's a background shared at the same time because schools may vary in, in in the way that they teach uh, okay. throughout the years. But we had interest, shared interest, Cornell, Puerto Rico, uh, urban interest, we together uh, with some other people, of course, we brought to Puerto Rico Colin Rowe, Fred Coulter, all sorts of architects, Aldo Rossi, who were very interested in the urban aspects that were the main concern in the 80s and 90s. So, so we had all that. Uh, Hector was more formal. Hector were, was more uh, geared towards his original training. And I became more interested in other aspects, more like restoration, more like building in around the island. And, um, you know, there comes a time where people just go on, on their own way. So, Jorge, when your career uh, was part with Hector Arce, you guys did a lot of like significant projects. One of them that I remember was like uh, the the Plaza Colon in 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 Old San Juan. Yeah. And I, I do you want to add a little bit about that? Because I know like in early in the career, there's project that really like guides you or you know change the perspective of how the career goes and maybe gives you more confidence in the future to do other things even better. Well, most of the credit, almost all of the credit for Plaza Colon goes to Hector. Hector was very much involved in the project before I joined the, the, the firm and we started our own. But I was involved in, in many of the controversy and the, and the construction itself. Hector was very dedicated to the project at hand. Hector was very motivated by uh, uh, articulating architectural details. And we learned a lot from that project because the original scheme proposed to have the, the statue of Columbus that sits at the center of the plaza to, have to move it so that it would sit as you enter the city, where now a policeman decides whether you go or, or in or not. Okay. <laughs> well, instead of a policeman, we were going to have Columbus there. Okay. Uh, and that was very important, but very controversial. Okay. And we found out, we learned a lot about people's resistance to change, even though history is all about change. Okay. At that time, there was also a controversy regarding Plaza de Armas, which architect Alberto del Toro had designed because he proposed the kiosk that is now in place. Okay. And Dr. Ricardo Alegría, who was behind all decisions at the time regarding the old city, opposed it, saying that it was not original. So then we got engaged in what is original. I mean, if it's original, do you just make it a forest because that's the way it was originally? So we learned about that. And then, among other projects, we did several restoration projects in the old city, housing projects. Okay. At the time, uh, Section 8 uh, federal sponsorship. But then we were also re uh, required to do guidelines for Santurce. And the guidelines were made, and that started some sort of differences between Hector and myself, because his vision of what Santurce should be and mine were sort of contradictory. And, uh, and that led to some of the differences that eventually uh, forced us to split. Uh, and that joined with other projects that we did at the time. You know, it, it was a great school for me. It was a great school for all of us. Okay. Us. Hector went on to do some very important housing buildings that are exemplary, and I'm, I'm very happy to have been there at the time. Okay. So, like, I know that after that you you worked by yourself for a little yeah. bit? Yeah. And then you... And then I joined uh, Juan Penabat. Juan Penabat. That he also worked with you guys in, in Arce. Uh, yeah. In yeah. Okay. When we split, some people stayed with one architect and the other, as, as is usual. Okay. And... Uh, Juan then went on to Yale for his master's, and uh, we had a good team, and we did several projects, houses, very important single-family residences. We did also the restoration of the cemetery in Mayagüez, 
And a building that is very close to my heart and that is here in the exhibit is the uh, cafeteria building for the botanical gardens in, uh, in San Juan for the University of Puerto Rico. Uh, it's a small project, almost like a folly, but it was very beautiful and luckily it's still standing there. Okay. And I know a very significant book from, I don't know if from that generation, it was in 1900 Puerto Rico. That was part, it happened kind of at that time or that came after? Well, Puerto Rico 1900 yeah. uh, came out as a result of the studies that I had made with teams of architects and students in the 80s under the sponsorship of the Architects Association, the Colegio de Arquitectos, and the State Historic Preservation Office. Okay. And we have been documenting, and we, we did a lot of drawing. I'm very proud of that because a lot of the uh, architectural samples that we documented thoroughly are no longer in place. So we have street sections, we have axonometrics. It, it's, a, it's a great portrayal of vernacular local architecture in the uh, mid to late 80s. And uh, to this day, all of that material is being used at schools by people. People talk about uh, the typologies that we identified uh, and the, the names we gave to some of the urban conditions as if they were terms that had no origin at all, but if they were, they were act, they came to be as part of those studies. And when that part of your interest behind education that happened, uh, like I'm just trying to, to tie like early parts of your career, that part of like your writing and also being involved as a, as a professor, because I know you have, that has been all tied together, I think from, from the yeah. beginning, right? Yeah. Uh, I think it started by wanting to communicate wanting to translate to people many of the projects that, that we have engaged in the office, some that have been commissioned, other because of our initiative, I, I call them translations. Okay. We think some things are important for whatever reason. So how, how do you communicate to someone that? And, and uh, the way that the School of Architecture at Polytechnic was thought was a way to translate architecture in different ways to young students that had not had access to the public school in Puerto Rico because at the time it was only one. Uh, so the whole curriculum, uh, as it was thought of, it was to be able to convey the, the importance of local architecture without being chauvinistic about it, to, to be proud about who we are, what we have done, but also to translate our relationship to the wider world because it, it was not focused on us, on ourselves only. There, there was interest in, for our students to actually become aware of how wide the world is. Okay. So the writing, the writing which came since high school, uh, has taken different turns. Puerto Rico 1900 is a very scholarly work. Footnotes, a thorough research for more than for more than 10 years. Uh, it's not that I was writing 10 years, but that book came to be after a lot of individual initiatives about the turn of the century period came to be. And then I went to Havana and I wanted to write about Cuba, but I had no time nor the resources to approach all of the thematic material. So I took the format of chroniclers and those are chronicles like a travel chronicle, four chronicles about the city. I've done essays, and at one point there are some things that you believe or understand on a very intuitive level, but you cannot sell them as the truth or a truth. And that's when I opted to write a play, uh, because I had written plays in high school and I wrote a play that's really all about Caribbean architecture on, 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 the, on, on the, the Hispanic Caribbean more so. Okay. There's anything coming now? Yes, yes, I fin I just finished uh, a thorough research on architecture in the 60s in Puerto Rico. Okay. Uh, some excerpts have come out, uh, uh, some articles, but it should be a book at some point. Uh, understanding all of those architects, designers, including interior designers, that 
in the more generalized explanation of the modern movement in Puerto Rico have been sort of shadowed by Henry Klum, Tori Ferrer, the big names, you know, the, the protagonists. So these are all the best supporting actors and actresses that have been on the, on the side. Uh, and I think it's, it's a very exciting period for people to know more about. That's great. I like that. That's awesome. So going back to the area of education and getting involved with the school and et cetera, one of the things that I, I, I actually saw by me and I think other colleagues that went to the school as well is the ability you had to be a good talent scout in a way understanding what is the talents and where, these peop these, where are your strong parts and your weaknesses and kind of push you to do the best in each one of the parts. It's something that I think you also share with Jaime Suarez when I spoke to him, that the school was not just concentrated in the in the talented ones. Also, it, you can tell like when I was speaking to Jaime that he, even, he took the same amount of care to even somebody that other people can mind, maybe this guy doesn't have a future on this. Yeah. But he still dedicate some time and heart to that, to that person to push him to that direction. And you can see the different successes of people in different departments in, in our career. Does it necessarily has to be the typical uh, Le Corbusier <laughs> architect, you know? Yeah, the big designer. The big designer. There's also different kind of like very talented uh, people that came from the school. And I, I don't know if you want to add something about that, but that's a, a skill that I think you have learned by the years on how to really like tweak and maybe guide somebody to the right direction, you know? It, it's a combination of acknowledging that people can grow and change. Yeah. But it's a, uh, also a little bit of persistence because as a teacher, I can tell you sometimes you are willing to give more to a student and sometimes they are, uh, they resist that kind of push. So you have to decide how you go about it. But when Polytechnic was set up, you know, in contrast with the very rigorous admission process at UPR because it was the only school, so they had to be very selective. We had a sort of open admissions a policy. Students with a C average could come in, and then they had to prove that they could perform at, at a higher, a, a much better grade. Uh, and in that sense, I can tell you, we had students at Polytechnic that came in with a profile most likely to fail in college and they ended up doing their masters in Harvard. So, and Harvard and other universities that they went to. So that gives you a sense of satisfaction of a job that you try to do the best, but it always has to do with how receptive the student is to face the challenge. Were as a dean almost eight years or more? No, no, for ten years. Ten years were, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, I bet that there's like a moment of how you develop all this school, and that this is a moment that you leave this kind of like this baby that you you grow with it, and uh, you there's a moment that you feel that there's a moment that uh, you know you need to pass it pass it on for the future. Yes, uh, I th I think my my. Training as a historian has taught me that change is inevitable and change is part of it. Uh, I was telling you before, when I was young, I was very critical about people who stay for too long in the same job uh -huh. because uh, that, that long tenure usually alienates a lot of people, even, even unwillingly. There's some people that feel closer to the guy or the woman in charge, and others feel that they are, do not integrate an inner circle, whether it exists or not. So after 10 years, uh, and, and after the panorama of architecture was changing in terms of parametrics and the use of the computer as a thinking tool, oh, several issues came into play. And I decided it was time for me to go and concentrate in my practice, which is what I've done without uh, leaving my teaching position. So I still teach at the school and I enjoy it very much. And, uh, and that gives me an opportunity to keep some of the ideas that led to the formation or foundation of the school at the beginning. Okay, great. And then I can bet that uh, once you finish that part of being the dean of the school, you took like a lot of more energy and time to your personal, you know, uh, practice. Yeah yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, the administrative tasks take a long time. Uh, yeah, yeah. I've seen too many people sort of. Uh, 
uh, denigrate the administrative aspect of a job, but if you want to get things done, you have to be in charge and you have to be able to administer properly for things to happen the way you want. So I was not tired of that. I just thought it was time for this school to evolve and it gave me a chance then to go on and keep doing some other things, like research and uh, the, this new book on the architecture of the 60s, concentrating on other efforts. OK. And, and going to the practice, and now that you're saying that after that you concentrated more uh, at your practice, can you tell me maybe these questions? I don't know how you're going to answer it. But can you tell me like five projects of yours that actually have marked you in your career, build, buildable projects? And maybe five of them that not got built, and we can talk a little bit about what we have <laughs> the around ones here. in the exhibit, yeah. Yes. Uh, well, uh, when you dedicate yourself to be an architect, you know that there will be some projects that are more significant than others. Yeah. And that does not uh, detract from having done a dentist office or having done a jewelry store. But other projects have the capability of summing up your concerns. Now, we talk a lot at the office about resignifying the land, about uh, giving value. In Spanish, I say puesta en valor, you know, giving added value to something that didn't have. So, in no particular chronological order, but the projects that we have been carrying out throughout the years in Hormigueros, a town in the southwestern part of the island, because we were given the opportunity step by step to add some interventions in town. From the second intervention, I was say from the first, we realized we had the opportunity of re-articulating the pedestrian network in a city that's very hilly, and people had a lot of trouble handling with the ramps. Of course, there was no concern for ADA compliance. So we have re-networked that town. And I'm, I'm very proud of that because it has been done with with small projects. Uh, the, with, there was recently an article on Florida Architect called Small Plus Small Equals Old. Okay. And that, that's, it was about a project, and that's what we had in mind. Uh, the building, the cafeteria building, the eating facilities at the botanical gardens have been important because it's a project that to this day people like. It doesn't seem dated at all, like some others might be. Uh, the Garden of Atonement we designed in, in Hormigueros, which is an open space that honors people who have been forced to live in exile. And we use vegetation to convey that. I'd like to use vegetation to say something in, in terms of why the choice of what you did. We've done some advocacy projects. I'm going by my third now, right? Uh, and that's a project that I have been pushing and that has not happened, but it's for Puerto Rico's government to open up the, what were built as irrigation channels in the early 20th century as ecotourism trails, because they're wonderful trails throughout the landscape, and you walk all along next to the water. We've done, twice we've had openings uh, like, um, like open houses in those uh, irrigation channels, and we've had over 3,000 people each time come. Everybody says, how come it doesn't happen? Because the trails are there. So, you know, lessons you learn as you go. Uh, a third and a fourth, you know, third and fourth place are always uh, a bit haphazard, right? Uh, but maybe those closer in time. I, I have an affinity for the preservation project for the entrance steps at the Mayagüez. Uh, cemetery, yeah, because there was one. a lot of contents in, in that project, and we were able to summarize uh, a lot of ideas. Uh, recent projects include the restoration of the theater at uh, Central High School in Santurce. It's funny because when I was a very young architect, I walked in and I saw that theater, and I said, gee, I wonder if one day I could restore this. And, uh, you know, 40 years after or something like that, we ended up having that project without actually going after it. So several projects that... Uh, and, and San Jose Cathedral? Well, yeah. it's not done, so oh, it's, yeah, I'm yeah. not including oh, my dad, there. Yeah, <laughs> I'm yeah, yeah. including it so in the a, list. So I, I, do have, I do have one more. I can do the fifth and probably should have been like the third or fourth, which was a residence we built in Bayamón uh, yeah, yeah. for a couple. Uh, she's Puerto Rican. He's from the States. And uh, 
it's not only the house that, that makes me very proud, but those are the kind of clients that you hope at least once in your life you will get, very conscientious, not just uh, uh, detached from the whole process or the cost. On the contrary, very aware of what architecture entails, but also what architecture means. So th those are significant projects. Right now, we face towards March 2020, when San Jose Church, after seven plus years of working there, uh, will be reopened to the public. And that, of course, is, is a very important project. I don't know if it's a capolavoro, but uh, still, it's going to be a very important project because many of the ideas have been able to come in with an understanding and an expanded understanding of what preservation should mean in Puerto Rico. Interesting. That's great. So, adding to that, uh, we are right now in uh, in exhibition that has been running now for a month. For two months. Two months. Uh, Posibilidades soñadas, like uh, how we can translate that in English. There. Well, uh, well, dream <laughs> possibilities. But yeah, that, yeah. That, that is a bit corny as a title. Yeah. That's that's the one that the sponsors very graciously, uh, Fundación Angel Ramos, who accepted to include architecture in this gallery where they usually uh, exhibit art. Okay. So we were pushing for architecture to be understood as that. Okay. We we had on uh, subtitled it the Puerto Rico that could have been. Okay. Because most of these projects will not be carried out, and uh, these are projects that were commissioned or that we started them, so they reached some stage of development. Other some started even being built, and construction was halted. But the idea was to give expanded life to these efforts okay. and to see them together in dialogue. And probably more important than that, to suggest to other people things that could happen in Puerto Rico, maybe drawn or thought by somebody else's hand or brain. A subject that I want to talk with you also is the future of architecture now in Puerto Rico. As you know, and a lot of my colleagues, uh, we went to school here and our preparation was excellent and it gave us doors, it opens doors to different opportunities around the world. I have friends that went to school with me that can tell me different stories and very great ones around. But unfortunately, a lot of that talent has gone away. And um, there's still good ones here as well, but I can tell there's a lot of people that I have left. So I want to know a little bit more your take about how you see the future in the profession. I see some pointers that may have a, a deep impact in the future. When the, when the school at Polytechnic was thought of, and we have to write it down, uh, we were very interested in preparing people to go elsewhere. Yeah. How many architects does Puerto Rico need? How many architects the economy can afford? So we're very proud that the students have, are elsewhere in America and yeah. in Europe. But take a look, for example, at the number of schools that have sprung after Polytechnic sort of broke the ice. Yeah. There are more schools of, archi of architecture in the island, and that will contribute a lot of diversity in terms of approaches, in terms of solutions. On the other hand, a lot of the architects have focused on building, on construction. And it started more in terms of carpentry uh, and uh, working woodworking or designing and building, students engage in build. And I think that might have been, uh, uh, a, 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 what should I say, pushed further. That, that, that has been pushed further by the fact that after the Hurricane Maria, after a period in which very opportunities were available for local students to be working in architects' offices to gain some training. And we were very aware of that. What is the generation going to have as an experience prior to face the field? But after Maria, because of FEMA and the insurance agencies and the government, a lot of architects, young architects, have sprung up to work in terms of assistance in construction, um, analysis of the status of the properties. And I think that we, we must understand that as an added edge to be engaged with the construction. Whether that will sophisticate their work or basically uh, make it more sober, given the experiences they have, nobody knows. But that, that is, in fact, very, very stimulating to think that new schools, more experience on the field, more dedication to how 
uh, the craft of architecture is faced, those I see as very positive signs. Okay, that's great. The economy is another story, yeah. but like they say, you know, uh, at some point it has to go up, at some point it has to improve. So maybe these uh, architects will be better trained with a more perceptive eye on how things are built and detailed, and that should be a big contribution to Puerto Rico's architecture. That's great. Hey, Rigal, thank you so much for this uh, conversation. No. I, I will, for the audience uh, watching us, I'm going to take great pictures of the exhibition here for the people out outside so you can have an idea of like the beautiful exhibition that right now Rial has on the walls. And um, thank you again. I hope we can Thanks do like you. many other conversations because this is only like 15% of your, of, of your experience with the okay. career. That's okay. Thanks to you and Epigram. Thank you so much. Okay. <laughs> cool. Thank <laughs> you.